My name is Mary Ellen Rogan, and I am the director here at the Plainfield Public Library. Thank you so much for joining us for this very special event. Before we begin, I'd like to ask everyone to please silence your cell phones out of respect for the presenter. I will now introduce our special guest, who really needs no introduction. George M. Johnson is an award-winning writer, author, and executive producer who now lives in the Los Angeles area. They are the author of the New York Times best-selling young adult memoir, All Boys Aren't Blue, discussing their adolescence growing up as a young black queer boy in New Jersey through a series of powerful essays. The book was optioned for television by Gabrielle Union. As a journalist, George has written for major outlets, including Teen Vogue, Entertainment Tonight, NBC, and BuzzFeed. In 2019, George was awarded the Salute to Excellence Award by the National Association of Black Journalists for their article, When Racism Anchors Your Health, in Vice Magazine. George was listed on the Route 100 Most Influential African Americans in 2020, the Out 100 Most Influential LGBTQ People in 2021, and in 2022 was honored as one of the Time 100 Next Most Influential People in the World. Their second memo, memoir, We Are Not Broken, was released in September of 2021. It received the Carter G. Woodson Award, which recognizes books that accurately and sensitive, sensitively depict the experience of one or more historically marginalized racial ethnic groups in the United States. The book also received the nonfiction honor book in the YA category from the International Literary Association. In 2021, they wrote the executive produced the dramatic reading of All Blur Boys Aren't Blue, starring Jennifer Lewis and Dylan Burnside, which received a 2023 Emmy nomination. The Emmy Awards will take place in September, and we wish them much success. As we come together to celebrate Pride Month, it is an honor for us to welcome George M. Johnson. <laughs> Rebecca Williams, who will be interviewing George. Rebecca, a Plainfield resident and former Plainfield City Council member, has served as Union County Commissioner since 2019. Rebecca teaches American literature, African American literature, speech, English composition, and women's literature as a full-time faculty member at Essex County College in Newark. In 2021, she broke ground in Union County's first inclusive LGBTQ plus affirming park space located within Cedar Brook Park. Known for an emphasis on constituent outreach, fiscal issues, support for the arts and cultural initiatives, and quality of life matters, Rebecca advocates for county local shared services that save tax dollars while improving efficiency. She has also been in the forefront of the LGBTQ advocacy working with the Union County Office of LGBTQ Affairs to address housing, senior services, education, health, public safety, community engagement, and other areas of concern. A frequent speaker on women's and LGBTQ plus empowerment, she has served on panels at the League of Municipalities and the Center for American Women and the Police politics at Russia, Rutgers Eagleton Institute, among others. 
Prior to, elect, to her election to the Board of Union County Commissioners, Rebecca served two terms on the Plainfield City Council in support of a progressive agenda and economic development contributing to Plainfield's revitalization. We are, welcome, we are honored to welcome Commissioner Rebecca Williams. Start. Yep. Everyone can hear me, right? As long as we project. Okay, okay great. Do the book excerpt here. Do the book excerpt first. And I was going um, to skip the book excerpt. Okay. <laughs> we can we can do a little excerpt, yeah, maybe a little good. bit later. But I think it's important for folks who don't know George to get to know them and see what they're about uh, beyond whatever you may have read uh, from one of the two two books. <laughs> So I just want to start, um, I had, hold on, I'm sorry, uh, a quote that I wanted to read, and it, it, it goes to this idea of memoir, and maybe you can comment on it. And this is a quote from the illustrious W.E.B. Du Bois, right? He says, autobiographies do not form indisputable authorities. They're always incomplete and often unreliable. Eager as I am to put down the truth, there are difficulties. Memory fails, especially in small details, so that it becomes finally but a theory of my life. With much forgotten and misconceived, with valuable testimony, but often less than absolutely true, despite my intention to be frank and fair. So because George has written two memoirs um, I thought this quote was, was fitting in the idea that a memoir is not an autobiography, strictly speaking. Um, and I like this idea of it being uh, a theory of one's life. So you want to comment on that? I know it's a long quote. No, it's fine. Um, I guess it makes me think about uh, what Zora Neale Hurston said. Uh, she was basically saying, like, as a writer, um, you wish you had all of the words and all of like the knowledge and all of the things when you write the book, right? And so she would say like that used to be her struggle um, when she was writing in their eyes of watching God because I think she wrote it in like eight weeks and she was like her struggle was there was so much that she wished that she could have put in the book years later. But she also was like, that's kind of what the brilliance of being a writer is, is like having the courage to know that you don't have all of the words and that you don't have all of the life experiences that you wish you would have had when you wrote a text, but you still courageously put the text out there for the world to judge it. Um, but I also think about, that's why I wrote the second book, right? It was like four stories got cut out of All Boys Aren't Blue. Um, and so those four stories are in We Are Not Broken. And so I think that kind of taught me as a writer that even when, <coughs> at some point you just have to be done. And it's like, all right, I've written this, that's it. And you just have to know that there's another day when I can write the next text that continues that story. Um, people always ask me about like, when is the adult memoir coming? When's the adult memoir coming? It's like, I don't know if I felt like I've lived enough life yet, right? But then on the other side, it's like I didn't felt, feel like I lived enough life when I wrote All Boys Aren't Blue. And so it's like that constant struggle uh, that happens when doing memoir writing because realistically, I'm just pulling memories from what I remember them as. Uh, I think with We Are Not Broken, it was a lot easier to write because I had my family involved to help construct the memory. So it was like we put it all together as a family um, with Nanny's quotes and everything. Uh, but with All Boys Aren't Blue, it was like, well, this is how I remembered it. And I, and like the, the story about, um, like even in We Are Not Broken, like we have a cousin's group chat and we got into it in the group chat because they, Raul and Masu swear that Raul broke the table, Nanny's coffee table, and Masu <laughs> broke the coffee table. But I was there and I was like, no, y'all were like fighting and y'all both went through the table. <laughs> and they swear, I mean, literally, they read the book and like we got in cousin group chat. They were like, Matt, you still got this story wrong. Like, Masu broke the table. And Masu was like, no, Raul broke the table. And I'm like, it, we're like, but it's been like 35 years. Like, why are we still arguing about this? 
Um, but that is kind of like the fun part about memoir writing is because we all have different perspectives of the exact same story. Um, and so I just put my version on it and then, you know, if they want to write a book, they can tell they saw it. <laughs> and you know, this, this, um, this uh, notion that you mentioned of you had to stop at some point. Yeah. Um, there's a quote, I don't remember who the quote was from, but uh, it was a painter, a, you know, very famous painter said, uh, a painting is never finished, just abandoned. Yeah. At a certain point, you got to move on, right? Um, so one of the things that, you know, um, I, I really like about this particular text is that it is specifically written for young people, right? Um, and we all know, I think, in this room that this book was one of the most banned books in the country. So there's like, a, I guess, a paradox there in that, um, in one sense, you ban a book and people are going to go and buy that book. So in some ways, it will increase sales. But, but the other side of it is that the audience whom you want to reach most, right? young people, particularly in school libraries and you know, young adult sections of libraries in certain areas, um, they will not have, they have a much harder time um, retrieving the book uh, to read it and to see if this is something that they should also, um, um, well, I guess uh, another piece of an arsenal for them to right. fight, uh, fight against, right? So any comments on on just the idea, I mean, you're still a young person in my sense, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but about, you know, your, 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 your real focus on young people, because it's also called a memoir manifesto, and, you know, manifesto is, that's, that's your declaration, yeah. right? That's your declaration of life and, yeah. and so forth. Yeah. yeah, I had a journalist when the book first came out. Um, he was kind of rude, but he was like, you got a lot of audacity calling your first book a manifesto. And he was like, why do you think this is a manifesto? I was like, well, I know what I know. So it, it is a manifesto. And like three years later, it's, I'm the most banned black author in the country. So clearly, I knew what I was saying when I wrote this book, that this was going to be a culturally changing thing. Um, I specifically write to young adults for several reasons. Uh, one, I was a kid who was forced to read the worst book in the world, Catcher in the Rye. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Like the fact that I still remember Holden Caulfield, and he was just a terrible archetype for anybody to have to, like, they were like trying to force us to be empathetic to this little spoiled boy's life. And I just, like, I just, I, and I, everybody always asks, like, was it your love of books that made you a writer? I said, no, it was my hatred for them. <laughs> and I hated the books I had to read. And so, you know, I live by the Toni Morrison quote, if there's a book you want to read and hasn't been written yet, then you must write it. And so I write the books that I wanted to have when I was a young adult. Um, there's a whole generation of kids who were just like me who now get to feel seen, get to feel heard, get to read about experiences that are very similar to the, their own that they're going through when they're having identity struggles and um, issues around a gender and sexuality right. and just trying to be a teenager, right? Um, and so I specifically write to them, but I also write to the young person that I think everyone has inside of us who still has trauma to be healed. Um, and so I always say All Boys Aren't Blue really wasn't written by like 30 year old me, it was written by five year old me mm -hmm. who finally had the words to say what, what I felt. And by 10 year old me and 15 year old me to be able to like put it out there finally and get it out of me, right, so that I could become the adult that I am today. Um, I think part of why the books are being banned is because uh, Generation Z is, you know, this is the first generation that's gonna be more non-white than white. And so it stoked a fear across the country, and they were already identifying as 20% LGBTQ on the 2019 census. Mm -hmm. And so when you look at the Don't Say Gay bill, and you look at banning abortions, you look at all of these things, um, they all go hand in hand together. They do not want the youth to have the truth about this country. Um, I know the people who are banning my book haven't read it because they're upset about chapter 11, but I, <laughs> I read Thomas Jefferson Fulfilled in chapter five. And so I'm always like, I know for a fact, if they read about what I said about George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, and Abraham Lincoln in chapter five, 
they would have been upset about it. So I'm like, I know they couldn't have read the book because they would have never even got to chapter 11. Um, so, we, so we know that what they're trying to do is they don't want the youth to, to have empathy for others, right? We all grew up kind of like siloed or kind of indoctrinated in a way where it was like, I played Abraham Lincoln in a school play. Like that makes no sense, right? But the way they used to teach Abraham Lincoln was like, well, this is the reason you get to sit with white kids now because he freed the slaves. And it's like, okay, but like, you know, like, but we also still needed a civil rights movement. And it also was Jim Crow. Like there was a lot of other things that happened too. Like it wasn't like he did this and like we just all of a sudden became equal. But he was almost taught in the same way that they would teach us Martin Luther King. Yeah. Right? Like, like this is one of your saviors and this is one of your saviors. And so the work that we do now as writers is to kind of like correct that and make sure that this group of teens and young adults who will be the next voting population, who will be the next CEOs, the next governors, the next mayors, the next presidents, actually know what the history of this country is. And so when they're banning books, they're just trying to literally make sure that they want kids to, to, to be dumb. Like that's really what it is. It's like they just don't want them to have the knowledge um, in the ways in which, like how generation after generation, it's like we look at quote unquote progress, but they know that this next generation could actually change everything. And in the last three years, you know, in the last three years, when they're looking at like the voting, right? Like, because it's like, you could look at the 20, 2020, what happened, and then you look at 2022 in the midterms, and the youth vote, they weren't polling for it. And so then when it started to turn it and all of these things were getting flipped, now you got a bunch of people who are like, wait, the youth actually go out and vote? And it's like, yes, because they actually go out and read. Right? And they read and we teach them these things, right? And so that's why they're trying to remove the books because the books is what's giving, it's activating them. Our books activate them um, in a way that I was activated. Cause like, what was holding call for co teaching? Right. So like, I couldn't be activated by the factory and by Invisible Man. And listen, he was calling them people savages. And I remember raising my hand in class, like, I'm sorry, are we talking about Native Americans when they say savages? And the teacher's like, yeah. Yeah. And it's just like, why is this okay? Like, you know, like, why do we have to read these type of texts? And our texts correct that, and they do not want the youth to be empowered by us. And so that's really what this is about. And that's why we fight so hard um, to keep the books in the libraries and to keep the books at, at as many access points uh, as right. they could possibly have. Yeah, and, you know, um, just to, to underscore that point, you know, there are upwards of about 500 bills. Um, targeting uh, the LGBTQ community, particularly our trans community, even at this this juncture. So, uh, what you're saying is, you know, critically important. Um, and you know, the other thing about the, you know, one of the other things that I really love about your memoir is its directness and its frankness. Um, in the in the opening, in the introduction, you say, because this is a memoir, I'm sharing some of my personal memories with you. So it's written in the second person, really inviting that audience in to your experience and into your life. Um, you know, and that's, you know, I've read a lot of memoir and I've taught memoir and sometimes they are very distancing, uh, but that's the joy of, of, of your work is that you really, we were all kids. I, Many of us, you know, remember breaking tables and blaming others <laughs> and, and, and so forth, right? So I, I just like how accessible it is. In addition to, you know, your work uh, to make the book accessible to everyone. And, you know, again, I can't, I can't thank the Plainfield Public Library and our yes. director, Mary <laughs> work so accessible and available and we actually do have uh, in our library a diversity collection uh, which you know kind of thumbs its nose as those, as those folks in Glen Ridge and other places as, as we all know right yes. so so I did want to um, you know I, I, I created some categories of, of sort of questions uh, thoughts that I wanted you to expand upon and one in the introduction uh, you know, you, you write black, queer, here, and you really talk about that, that intersection of your blackness and your queerness, which many of us who are black and queer, you know, have been forced to struggle with and deal with. 
um, in, in, in terms of where we find community. So if you don't mind, I would like to read a little passage and then have you comment on it. Yeah. Okay. Gender is one of the biggest projections placed onto children at birth, despite families having no idea how the baby will truly turn out. In our society, a person's sex is based on their genitalia. That decision is then used to assume a person's gender as boy or girl, rather than a spectrum of identities that the child should be determining for themselves. Nowadays, we are assigning gender even before birth. We have become socially conditioned to participate in the gendering of children at the earliest mo possible moment, whenever a sonogram can identify its genitalia. Gender reveal parties have become a trendy way to celebrate the child's fate, steering them down a life of masculine or feminine ideals before ever meeting them. It's one of the more visible, it, it's as if the more visible LGBTQIA plus people become, the harder the heterosexual community attempts to apply new norms. I think the majority fear coming, becoming the minority, and kind of to your point earlier. And so they will do anything and everything to protect their power. I often wonder what this world would be like if people were simply told, you are having a baby with a penis or a vagina or other genitalia. <laughs> Look up intersex if you're confused about other, that's in quotes. What if parents were also given instructions to nurture their baby by paying attention to what the child naturally gravitates toward and to simply feed those interests? What if parents let their child explore their own gender instead of pushing them down one of the only two roads society tells us exist? So it's those what ifs. So, comment? Yeah, um, it's interesting, right? Like, <clears throat> like if you're a little boy, and you want an easy bake oven, it's like, absolutely not, right? But then, most of the top chefs in the country are men. <laughs> so it's like, what, you know, like, it's like, you, you, it's like this interesting world that we live in where it's like, well, a boy can't do these things. You're not supposed to do these things. But then once you become a man, I guess, it's like, all of a sudden, like, you can be the top chef, you can be Emerald Lagasse, you can be anything. You can be the cake boss, like, you can make cakes, right? But like. A little boy that wants to make cakes is almost shunned and shamed, right? Um, and so I think that's where I was going with that. Um, in Ghana, there was a tribe in Ghana many, many centuries ago. They would wait until the child was six years old to assign gender. They would literally wait and see, like, well, what is the child gravitating to? How is the child moving? What are the child's mannerisms? And, and then start to have the conversation around how the child should identify. Um, and so, you know, I think what happens is when we assign these things, it just puts us like down these pipelines of like, oh, well, let's go buy footballs and let's go buy trucks and let's go buy guns. And then if it's a girl, it's like, well, let's get her, which, okay. I have no idea why like we don't want like little boys to have baby dolls because it's like, okay, so they have children and now you've given a little girl a baby doll. So she, and you've given her the vacuum, and you've given her all these things, so she know how to cook, know how to clean, know how to take care of baby, but it's like, you don't think men should know how to take care of kids? Men don't need to know how to cook. Like, men don't need to know how to vacuum or clean. And so I always find that so, like, interesting. And, like, I think the, the dope thing is that I grew up with a grandmother who didn't care about gender norms. <laughs> and so, because Nanny had all grandsons and we got up every Saturday morning and cleaned that house from top to bottom. She did not care. Like, clean, she was like, cleaning is a thing that everybody should know how to do. Right? That, um, if you a boy or a girl, like, yeah. you know, why you got on dirty underwear? That was one of her quotes. Like, <laughs> Don't you never leave this house without clean underwear. Little boys need to have on undershirts. Like, she had all of these things that was just like, like, I don't care if you're a boy or a girl, like, if you go clean them vases, like, it was just, like, her norm. She taught right. us how to cook. I know how to cook very well. Like, she didn't see it as those type of things. Like, she just allowed us to do what we wanted to do. And I mean, I, my entire family allowed that, right? It's like, I got to grow up with a transgender cousin named Hope, right? And to us, it was just normal. I didn't know that wasn't something that other families didn't have until the outside world started looking at me funny because I had a transgender cousin. But our family always made it like 
a normal thing, mm -hmm. right? And if I'm right, it's like even like my birth, like my mom didn't know what I was like when I was born. Like she didn't, you know, want to know. And so, like, more, we should be more like that, right? And then like when we're blessed with a child, just like rock with, just rock with the child, like you know, and like see what your child does. Um, I, you know, I often think that the story, the book does so well because everybody opened the book expecting that my family hated me. Like when, like when they saw what the book was, it was like, oh, this is gonna be like trauma hour, great. Like another black kid traumatized, we love that. Right. And then you get through the book and you're like, oh, this is not that story. This is the story of a, a, a black kid who was exhibiting queerness and had full family support, yeah. right? And so that's something that's like a rarity, but like it meant that my family got to become the possibility model. And so it's like, that's why I say those type of quotes because we're a possibility model of what it looks like when you just nurture the child that you have and love the child that you have unconditionally. Um, <laughs> It's funny too because it's like there's a picture in the book of like me with all my cousins and like my cousin Bernard is right there. He's in the book. Like there's a picture of being Bernard. in the book. You know what I mean? And so it's like, and even with them, like they always knew that I was like different and I was queer, but they always just was like, but that's Matt. Like they were like, we don't care, but like we that's just Matt. Like Matt Matt, you know, like that's just how Matt roll. And it's like I never felt judged, I never felt any of that. And so like my family now gets to be a possibility model for so many others. And so again, it starts to fight what the societal norm is, right? right? Like how the black church sometimes shames us and how sometimes in the barbershop, it's like I have to correct it when they use the F word. It's like, you know, but, but this book in my family and the things that we do is starting to shift all of those norms. Yeah. Um, and so that's why I write the way I write and that's why I, I, I wrote that particular quote because it's like nothing has to be in a binary. Right. People always say like, you gotta sometimes pick the lesser of two evils. And I'm like, but what if I just choose not to pick evil? Right. right. Like there's always a third option. And so I think that's what the book, or what I'm trying to do when I say those things. Yeah, you know, uh, a few years ago I interviewed, uh, well I had a another kind of conversation like this with uh, Jody Patterson, yes. the author of The Bold World, which was a memoir uh, about her transgender child, um, and you know, as opposed to the official narrative that you know you you, you put out, you know, that you said is out there, there are black families that nurture, that accept, and that have always done so. So when you know when I see overarching um, ideas about homophobia in the black community, there's homophobia, homophobia in black communities, just as there is certainly homophobia in other right. communities, but right. for some reason our, you know, uh, pathologies yeah. are always magnified um, mm -hmm. and made to seem, you know, well, you better not go there because you know how black people are about gay people and, and, and so forth. So I like that this particular, um, well, this one in particular is uh, really serves as a corrective uh, for that. So. Um, I do want to switch a little bit because we are here in front of a hometown crowd. Yes. Woo! So, <laughs> I know that folks here, and I know some of you know, uh, folks that you went to school with are also here, um, <laughs> want to hear a little bit about in more detail, and for those who have not read the memoirs yet, uh, want to hear a little bit about growing up in Plainfield, Attending Plainfield schools, you know, what life was like. Just a little, if you can give us a, a little bit of that. Yeah. Um, I'm like, growing up in Plainfield, um, I don't know, it's interesting. It's like, um, I went to cook school. So, <laughs> I started out, right, I started out at cook school. Um, okay, and it's funny because, like, we shouldn't have went to cook school. <laughs> because we live on Lansdowne, or we live on um, Sloan, which is all the way across that. But Nanny lived on Lansdowne, and she wanted all of us to go to the same school. So that's how me, Raw, Rasul, Garrett, Bernard, 
it was enough. What about our other cousins was there too? But that's how we all went because we used our address. Now it's kind of funny though because now you go to jail for that. Yeah. <laughs> like, if, 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 yeah, like you literally go to jail now if you put your kid in a school that's not in a district. Um, but back then, it just made sense because it was like all our parents worked, and it was like, well, somebody gotta watch them when they get out of school. So it was like, well, they need to all go to the same school. And so that was kind of like my upbringing was. It was like I went to school with all my cousins, right. and I went to school with like like family friends, and like I had um, like Aunt Darlene is here, like, and that's Aunt Sarah's best friend, right? But it's like I had a lot of aunts, right? And like cousin Lachelle is here, like it's like I had a lot of aunts and cousins, and just like a whole bunch of people. Um, who surrounded my playing field experience. Um, and then I went to Maxson Middle School. <laughs> <laughs> it's always happens in Plainfield. Yeah. I went to Maxson Middle School. Um, and you know, Maxson was cool. Uh, but then, you know, we were becoming teenagers and then that's when we started to go to Miss Kim House. And Miss Kim is here. And so we would go to Miss Kim House and Justin is her son and we call Justin my cousin too. So I had another cousin I was going to school with. Um, so that really was my playful experience. And then my uncle, uh, Raul and Aunt Crystal, they lived on 7th, on the, that, that, the blue house on the corner. Y'all know what you mean. Yeah. Um, right, on 7th and Berkman. And then he had the barbershop right around the corner where he used to sell the paintings outside. And so like, part of my playful experience was like, my mom had a hair salon, so on Saturday, she would just drop us off at the barbershop in the morning, and we just would be there all day. Um, with him and with my cousins, and we would be the last haircuts he would do at the end of the night because he would work all day. And then we would either spend the night at uh, all of our schools and play video games all night. But like that was our was really my experience when it talk when it comes to like that. Then when you get to the Sloan experience, my mom and my dad was basically like the parents of all the kids on Sloan. Uh, essentially, it's a long block. Right, it's a long block. But like we had like a whole community of kids, and we. we we used to stay over our houses, and you know, when we were little, we would have sleepovers. We would do all of those type of things. And then, when they got older, they would get drunk. My dad would pick them up off the porch, and bring them out. <laughs> <laughs> um, because you know, they would just go to sleep on the porch. But they knew it was like a safe space. So it was like playing field was always home. It was always like my safe space. Um, I always knew I had family. I always knew I had somewhere to go. And I think that's what I like to talk about. Like in the book, it was like even if society had so many thoughts or so many ideas or so many opinions about how I was presenting myself or performing, I always knew I could come home. Um, and that's what Plainfield is. Like, Plainfield is really home. Um, there have been multiple of us who have lived in my daddy's house at multiple times. It was like a revolving door. Um, and, and we had a grandmother, like, Nanny used to take people in. Like, she used to bring people to our cookouts, and we'd be like, who is this? Like, she just always had, like, a random crew of people that she was bring around us. But, like, you know, we, we got to, to grow up, like, in a really, really good way. And, like, one of the things she used to always say was, like, it was important for kids to see the world. And so she was adamant about us not just being in Plainfield all the time. So she would take us on vacations every single year. We would go to California, and we would go to Myrtle Beach, and we would go to Virginia, and we would go down south. Because um, she wanted us to know our roots, and she wanted us to understand like how important it is for black kids to see the rest of the country and not be trapped in the environments that they're in. Um, or in the cities that they're in. Like she would, she would say like, there's some kids who have never left New Jersey, yeah. right. have never seen anything outside of New right. Jersey. She just never wanted that for us. And then when I look at like the old family photos, it's like she also used to take her kids mm -hmm. traveling all over the place. So it just was something she ingrained in us. And so, you know, I've been to Paris, I've been to Barcelona, I've been to Mexico multiple times. Like I travel the world and I see the world because of how my, my family was and how, you know, it was like Plainfield is home, but you also need to know and see this world. Right. So, you know, one of the things that you do, to, I do want you to talk a little bit about high school and about, I know. <laughs> well. I didn't mention it. That's why I didn't say anything about that. <laughs> In my Plainfield experience, but we could go there. <laughs> much about high school, but just, you know, as you mm. are developing yourself and, and understanding yeah. your, your sexuality and yeah. who you are as a person, um, what that experience was like. <laughs> uh, 
the yeah. good, the bad, and the right. ugly and indifferent. Yeah, mm-hmm. high school was like, ugh, like, <laughs> daddy didn't want me to go to play for high. So I was like, all right. So I was fighting too for Nail, though. And Nanny, we, we put up a good fight, but daddy was like, absolutely not. Like, mm-hmm. you're, going, you're going to Catholic school. I was like, ugh, all right. So I had to go to Bishop Bar, which I think is now St. Thomas Aquinas. Yeah. Okay. Again. 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 Right. Which is also, I don't know, there's some tea behind that. Because I'm like, what did Bishop R do? Because they must have swept some scandal under the rug. Because I'm like, <laughs> I was like, because you don't just switch a school name from a bishop, but he was under McNamara. And I was like, that's when all that drama was happening. When I was like, yeah, it's some tea there. I'm going to find it. I'm a journalist. So I always say, I'm so a journalist. I'm going to figure out what Bishop R did. Because I'm like, you don't just change the school name back to the old name. But I, um, I had to go to Bishop R. Mm-hmm. Damn, it's a lot of trauma there. That's the only reason I go by George. Mm-hmm. Like, because like they had so many like rules and standards. Like, I went by Matthew through at Cook, I was Matt, at Maxon, I was Matt. I could use Matt on all my papers. Bishop R was the only place they were like, no, you cannot go by your middle name, you have to go by George. <laughs> and it wasn't like, I guess like when I look back at it, it was kind of traumatizing because it was like, that's not who I am. And so like, I already was struggling with my identity. Now I got to go by this different name. I'm at this school where I'm now, I've been going to black schools. Now I'm in the minority. Um, it's like maybe 30 black students at this school, you know, and, you know, and then like you go into school with like kids that are like, into hip hop, so they like, what's up, homie? And you like, excuse me? Like, what are you talking about? Like, you know, and they're like, where's your posse at? And I'm like, my what? Like, it was just like, I don't know, it just was so, such an interesting experience. And I mean, even I write about it in All Boys Aren't Blue, and um, we just had our 20 year high school reunion two weeks ago, because I went. And so it was cool to see some of the, some of the people there, but like, even my history teacher, like, <laughs> when he said, um, we were talking about slavery, he was a white guy, and he was like, yeah, because if I lived in the 1800s, um, I would have owned slaves. And it was me, Janet uh, Johnson, and Leanne LeBennett, the only three black students in the classroom. We looked at each other like, did he just say that out of his mouth? And so of course I raised my hand, I was like, excuse me. Like, why would you have been an abolitionist? Because if you knew, if you know that you would own slaves, then what the hell do you look at us like in this classroom right now? Like, there were white people who were abolitionists back then too. So I think that started to shape my mindset around like race in a way, because I'd only been in school with black kids. So, you know, you don't really, so like a lot of queer people will say I was called the F word before I was called the N word. And I'm like, well, well, duh, because I was only around black kids, so why would a black kid call me the N word, right? So it's like, but then you get into high school and it's like, oh, now I am being called this word, or now y'all are using this word in a way, you know? And so it's like, you start to really see what your intersections yeah. look yeah. like. And so high school is really what brought like that to mind. And that was like, when I knew, I was like, I am leaving New Jersey because I do not want to go to Rutgers with these same kids. Like, I cannot do it. <laughs> and, and that's why I threw my ass in uh, a black HBCU in the South <laughs> named Virginia. I was like, I'm going blackity black. I'm going to Virginia. I'm going to an HBCU that I know it's the oldest one in the South. It was founded on slave fields. I'm like, I'm I'm going all the way in to get back back into black. You know, um, I pledged. I did, but like, I think my high school experience was what forced me to really. Like, be like, you know what, like, I don't ever want to not be black. I don't ever want to not feel black and be around my people and surrounded by my people. And it's like, I'm going to still do this good work and I can still associate with other groups, but it's like, I just want to be around my people. And so my high school experience is what defined my college experience. Right. And so going to Virginia Union, going to a, an HBCU, um, you know, how, how did that uh, experience contribute to who you are today, and and related to that is you know your um, your writing career, your desire to write was that always with you, or did it develop you know when you got older? I know uh, one thing that I would say is this individual um, asked <laughs> when we were in the back, uh, George asked about uh, whether there could be a search on all the books um, t- that, that you that took, took out. out. As, as a kid, and of course the library doesn't keep those kinds of records, but uh, this is a reader. So, yeah, so the question about the HBCU experience, just a little bit, and then um, 
you know, I, I think folks are interested in your writerly life. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, my, my writing was shaped by black women professors. Um, black women professors, like when you go to a HBCU, they basically are like, all right, I'm your aunt now, so I'm gonna be on you, I'm gonna be on top of you, like, you know, making sure you're doing the things you need to do. Um, Professor Murray, who, I st who still texts me regularly, um, Professor Murray, Patricia Murray, was like my first person who challenged me, who knew, like saw something in me. Um, she put me on the Honda Campus All-Star Team, which is basically like uh, a Jeopardy challenge between 64 different HBCUs every year. Mm -hmm. That happens, a lot of people don't know about it, but basically I was the captain of the Honda Campus All-Star Team, so it was like Jeopardy. And so like we would battle each other, kind of like that episode of A Different World. Yes, yes, yes. yes where yes. Whitley and Dwayne, uh, for everybody remembers, there's an episode where Whitley and Dwayne are on a team and they're battling other colleges. That actually is real, um, but it just happens with HBCUs every single year in Florida. Uh, well, maybe not Florida anymore. But, <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, maybe not Florida anymore. I think they did move it because DeSantis, I think it's in Charlotte now. Um, but, you know, that helped shape who I was as a debater, as a, you know, a thinker, um, a thought leader. Um, and then, you know, I went to two HBCUs. I went to Union for undergrad, but I also went to Bowie State for my master's degree. Um, and so at Bowie State, it was um, Dr. Wendy, um, Dr. P, and uh, Dr. J, who really saw something in me and was like, you're special and we need to like craft this. And so, um, like I did my dissertation on emotional intelligence. Um, I did it without using, I did it straight from my head. I just, you know, to, to defend my stance on it. I did like a 25 minute speech with no papers or no defense, anything. Yes. I did defense. Yes. And I was only 25 at the time. I was nervous while doing it, but Dr. J was just like, you got this, like okay. you can do this. Like I see something in you that's different. And like you're supposed to like change the world because that, you're just like, your mind just thinks so differently yeah. about things. Like you can always see like the other angle that everybody is missing. Yeah. Um, and I think that's what kind of led uh, me into writing. And a lot of my friends, they say, they were like, you always said you were gonna write a book. Mm. I, like, a lot of my friends, like, even when, like, I, like, was in a fraternity and I just crossed, they were like, you had been talking about that you were gonna write a book, but you just had no idea what it was, but you just knew that at some point one day you were going to write a book. Um, and so then when I got the book deal and I wrote it, like, a lot of my first messages were coming from friends, like, do you remember when we was um, lit at the bar <laughs> in DC and we were talking about our dreams and you said you was gonna write this book and they were, I was like I do remember that conversation they're like no they were like you used to tell people all the time like what you were going to do and they were like you're just such a manifester like when it comes to that because like you just speak it and then you just do it um, but I think I got that from having really really amazing black women professors who you know they, they don't just challenge your mind, they challenge every piece of you yes. to, to be a productive person in society. Um, and I think the great thing about the professors I had at the HBCU is that they were less concerned about assimilation mm -hmm. and more concerned about who you were as a person and what you could do to actually change the world. Right. Um, and so I'm grateful for that because I didn't have to assimilate, I didn't have to dress a certain way, I didn't have to talk a certain way. They allowed me to just be myself and allow that individuality that I have to shine over everything else. Mm -hmm. okay. And um, uh, when we were, also when we were backstage, um, we talked about, a little bit about all boys aren't blue. I also do want to call everyone's attention to We Are Not Broken, which is another memoir and what I love about this is just the generosity these are all this is everybody this is the family right there's nanny there's everyone so yeah but that's the and then real, the, yeah, that's the real this, picture that's the real picture <laughs> but just the idea of having the entire family uh, on the cover of the book um, and we know that family is is incredibly important to you yeah. and you know, as I, I mentioned, as, as we, we discussed before, um, your experience is not the kind of experience that, that we generally see written, right? Because as you mentioned, it's all the sort of trauma porn, right? Um, can you say just a little bit more about 
your identity and your family, and then going out into the world and seeing that the world is not like your family. Um, because, you know, I know your mom. <laughs> she had to push you out a little bit, right? And it's not, you know, and, and of course a strong family foundation, you know, is, is central to your yeah. identity and who you are, but there were also some uh, scares and fears out there. Yeah. So. I mean, there still are, like, yeah. you know, um, like I almost got into a fight at the airport, what was that, three months ago, um, mm. with a man from Iowa who just happened to recognize my face um, while ah. we were in the bathroom, because in Iowa, the governor of Iowa <laughs> got on TV, read a, a explicit part of my book, and then said she was creating a law to put anybody in jail who gave my book to a teenager. But she did this all over Iowa, so my face is all over the screens in Iowa. And so this guy happens to recognize me while I'm in Wisconsin at the airport, and he's just like, uh, I would never let my three sons read your book. And I was like, well then let them be dumb. Like, you know me, I'm like, yeah. <laughs> So he's like, don't you call my kids dumb? I'm like, I'm calling them dumb because you dumb. Like, so I walk out the bathroom and he like following me. And so, I don't know, I guess in their mind they think like, you know, because we authors or something like that, we're just like docile and we're just thinkers. And so, so I took my book back off. I was like, yo, I'm from New Jersey. Like, I would knock you the F out in this airport. And so now, of course, now I'm threatening him. He's like, whoa, you're threatening me. And I'm like, yo, you just followed me out of a bathroom. But I, I guess I say all of those things to say, like, you know, I was, you know, we were raised by a grandmother who used to say, you got to bring ass to get ass. And she was a fighter. We were just talking about her fighting the other day. Um, so she was a fighter. So it was like, at heart, you know, I came from this family that was always like fighting, like, but not just fighting physically, but like fighting for each other, fighting for our own growth, fighting for our own dreams together, separately, um, and we always supported each other and pushed each other, and so, uh, you know, once I got into the world, you know, the world isn't an easy place, you know, for me these days, right? Having a book this banned, I have to have security at events, it's like, hell, they shooting up grocery stores, like, what's gonna stop somebody from coming here and shooting up my book event, right? Yeah. Like, and I have to think about those things, but I also still can't be, like, living in that type of fear every day, right? Um, and so, you know, when I think about just society versus family, it's like, I'm still fortunate that I have my family, right? Like, they're always like my, my go-to, my source, my backup, um, you know? And I think the, the dope thing about my family is like, we don't just have like the familial relationships of like aunt, cousin, this, like we all are friends, right? And I often talk about how like, when I was processing Nanny's death, like, the hardest part for me wasn't like that I lost my grandmother, it was that I lost my friend. Cause she was just a cool lady. Like she was just cool to be around. Like, you know, it was like, oh, where you going? I'm going to hang out with Nanny. And you know, people are like, you gonna hang with your grandma? I'm like, yeah, we're gonna play rummy, we're gonna talk shit. Like, you know, like, you know, like we gonna like we gonna play cards and we're gonna drink tea and we gonna, you know, and she gonna cook and we gonna watch um, Little Women Atlanta and I'm sure a Tyler Perry movie will come on and she and we'll sit there and cackle and she'll go through the photo books and tell a story. It was like she just was a cool lady to hang with. And so I think like about like how like that's how my family is set up. Like we're not just like family by family. Um, I'm gonna say this joke, so don't get don't please don't feel, feel offended, some of y'all. But like we used to joke all the time, um, like when we were in high school, I'd be like, yo, do white people have cousins? <laughs> and I would joke like that because, like, I would see those kids, like, walk up to their aunt and be like, hey, Marge, hey, Pat. And I'm like, hey, don't be your aunts. Like, you don't call her aunt Marge. They're like, no, that's Marge and Pat. I'm like, I'm like, hell, I even my play aunts got, like, I call, like, you know, Aunt Cheryl, like, Aunt Tara. Like, them ain't even my bro. They're my mom's best friends. Like, you know, it's, it's just like, I think about that, like, right? Like, that's how my family setup is, mm -hmm. and I think that's how it helped, has helped me to navigate a society mm -hmm. um, in ways that may be against me, uh, because I've always had such a strong support system. And, you know, what you mentioned about that, well, we can call it what it is, the harassment mm -hmm. yeah. at the airport, you know, it, it kind of connects to your activism. One, one thing I do want to throw out there is that, you know, um, and, and, and this is, a plug for Union County. Uh, as you may know, uh, we were uh, uh, we were the first 
county in the state to establish an office of LGBTQ affairs, one of very few in the country. Since then, Essex has ridden their coattails. Uh, <laughs> they opened an office up. We were, yeah. their, their records are funded now. But we also uh, just, uh, we, we rolled out earlier this year, actually at the beginning of Pride Month, a safe, safe place initiative. If you've seen on the doors of you know, uh, stores and uh, you know, organizations, this sort of rainbow uh, sticker, it's, um, it's an initiative that um, enables anybody who feels threatened uh, for, for whatever reason, but particularly LGBTQ folks, um, in, in our county, in our community, to, um, to go into that establishment and they will call the police, they will stay with you and um, make sure that you are safe until you can get home. And I only bring that up, um, well, for a number of reasons, just to show how wonderful our county is. Uh, but okay. a work in progress, you know, I'm not gonna be a Pollyanna about it, but a work in progress. Um, but it, it kind of relates to this, this idea of the harassment that even well-known individuals such as yourself experience. So let's think about what it's like for young people here who are still navigating you know, that identity. Um, so I wanted to just uh, talk to you, well, hear from you a little bit about the kind of activism that interests you and that you are, are working on now, and then we'll talk about the What's next? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so for the last, well, oh God. For the last two years, I've been fighting book bans across the country. Um, you know, it was being done in a way that was very like inconspicuous at first. So um, I just had Google alerts set up. And so with the Google alerts that were set up, I just happened to see that they were banning the book in like small counties like here and there. And so when it got to eight counties that banned the book, um, when it got to eight counties, <laughs> when it got to eight counties that banned the book, <laughs> um, <laughs> when it got to eight counties that banned the book, I made a tweet about it. And so the tweet went viral. And when the tweet went viral, that's when everybody started to like, oh, like they're banning books across the country. <laughs> so this was in November of 2021. So that next week, um, Jill Woolbright, because I'm not just going to call her a Karen because she has a name. Jill Woolbright went and took my book to a sheriff's office and filed a criminal charge against the book and against me. So that basically pissed me off. And I was like, oh, yeah, I'm definitely fighting this now. Like, and so for the last two years, I've been basically fighting fascism um, as they have been trying to remove books <laughs> from, uh, from every library, school library. Um, it's been a tough journey. We've won in some places, we've lost in some places. Uh, we filed a federal lawsuit about eight weeks ago um, that I'm a part of in Florida to try and um, really fight against the book bans. Um, it's probably going to get to the Supreme Court at some point um, because that's just how this operates. Um, but you know, it's like we're ready for, even if, if I have to testify in front of the Supreme Court, we're already ready for it. We've been asked, like, would we be willing to do that? Um, but yeah, that's been my main fight is like protecting literature for uh, children. Um, I'm still very, very active within HIV work. Um, I've been doing HIV advocacy, activism for nearly a decade now. Um, so I still publicly do that because that's still an epidemic that we still yes. need to end uh, in the country. Um, and then, um, you know, just, just being a public LGBTQ person, right? Like just being a public queer person. Like I think that's a form of activism. My writing is a form of activism. Um, and I was telling, uh, I was talking about it this morning with Munch, um, how like when I started just in like doing activism work, mm -hmm. Well, let me not say when I started. As an adult, when I started doing activism work, because Nanny had me have a soup kitchen when I was 14 years old. So <laughs> I've been doing community activism since Plainville days, like because we used to deliver soup to the sick and shut in Plainville. Um, when it was about 10 years ago, when I met um, one of my good friends, Twiggy Garcon, and I met um, Gabriel Maldonado, and I met my best friend Preston Mitchum. And we were just all these advocates who were just doing work in community. 
um, whether it was HIV work, Preston was doing legal work, um, Preston was doing reproductive health work, um, Swiggy was doing homelessness work. And we were all these like low level broke employees that would meet at happy hour and we all became like this circle of friends. Um, and that's, this was in 2013. And so it's just so interesting because now my best friend Preston is on Summer's House Martha's Vineyard um, and has this banging um, consulting firm. Twiggy was the choreographer for the show Pose, um, is an award-winning director. Me and Twiggy were nominated for an Emmy eight, six weeks ago. Um, and our friend Gabe, he started an HIV organization about 15 years ago when he was 18 years old called True Evolution um, in Riverside, California. And you know, 15 years later, next week, he will be unveiling a $20 million homelessness complex in one of the houses, one of the houses, um, one of the houses is named after Twiggy and one of the houses is named after me. Um, yeah, the house that's named after me is for um, people who are 60 plus who have um, severe physical disabilities. And the reason that that house was the house I got was because me and my mom took care of um, my grandmother um, at in-home hospice care for the last six months of her life. And so in just gave knowing that we were caregivers in that way to people who were above the age of 60, um, he just felt it was befitting for me and for Nanny to kind of like honor her legacy um, in that way to continue to help people who um, have disabilities at that age. That's excellent, excellent, excellent. So I'm gonna ask you to do something that you... There you go. <laughs> well, you know, a, a lot of the focus today has been really on your family. Yeah. So I was wondering if, and the library wants this as well. Yes. Um, <laughs> If you wouldn't mind, and it's a short excerpt, okay. reading the chapter, Dear Mommy. Is that something you can read? Uh, yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let me see how many pages this is. It's like get... two and a half pages. It's relatively short. Yeah, my, I don't want to get tongue tied. <clears throat> you can skip through. If I'm, no, I won't skip through. I'll, I'll okay. read it. Um, just okay, so project. All Boys Aren't Blue, for those who may not have read it yet, um, one of the one of the cool things that I decided to do was to write letters to certain people. Um, like certain people are in chapters, but then I felt like I wanted to kind of like do something different. I felt like <coughs> letter writing is like a form that kind of got lost when email got introduced. And um, when I was in college, I used to write letters to my grandmother's best friend, Miss Butler. And so that was like something extremely special to me was like letter writing because I knew like every couple of weeks I would get a letter in the mail um, with a check in it. Um, <laughs> his brother was cool like that. So she would always write me a long letter um, talking about the grandkids and just talking about things and asking how school was going. Um, but I've always thought that was like one of the most personal, beautiful forms of writing that you could do. And so that's why I did it in All Boys Aren't Blue. Um, and then We Are Not Broken, I had all of the grandkids uh, be able to write a letter or say something to Nanny. Um, but this letter was to my mom. Um, and so it goes, Dear Mommy, it's so hard to put into words what you mean to me. You are literally the strongest person I know. You are a protector and also a provider. You are the one phone call I always knew I could make, no matter the situation. You pray for me, give me advice when I need it, and go above and beyond the duties of a mother whenever necessary. As a kid, people used to say I was your twin. <laughs> Little K was my nickname, some would call me. I'm sure my being your first child was a lot for you. You can have all the experience in the world of helping raise your brothers and sisters, nieces and nephews, but it's something different when you become the primary caregiver of someone else. The world gives you no breaks as a black woman. I know it was likely even harder raising a black queer kid in a society that already makes it difficult to raise a black child without the additional marginalization. I know you, <clears throat> I know you knew from a very young age that I was going to be queer. From early on, you were putting the pieces in place to ensure that I had the community I would need when I got older. Making my godmother, Aunt Audrey, who just so happens to be a lesbian, caused interesting conversations in the family, I'm sure. But you always seem to know what's best. And once again, you made the right decision. I remember the first time I thought I was going to lose you. There were a bunch of visitors in and out the house, more than usual. I was about 10. 
old enough to know something was going on. I remember coming out of my bedroom to find you in the living room talking to Aunt Darlene. You could see my face that I was panicking and you asked me what's up. And I ran into your lap crying said, and said, I just wanna know what's wrong with you. About a week later, when picking us up from Nanny's house, you put me and Garrett in the car and before you pulled off to take us home, you said, I don't want y'all to worry, but I have to go into the hospital to have brain surgery. But everything is gonna be okay, okay? We both said okay, knowing, we both said okay. Knowing what I was feeling, I can only imagine what you were going through. Telling us everything was going to be okay, although doctors told you that the risks were much higher. On the day of your surgery, I sat in school thinking, and thinking about you, wondering if you made it through. Not only did you survive, but you went right back to business as usual, as soon as you possibly could. You didn't want to be waited on hand and foot. You didn't stop life. You picked up the pieces and learned to walk and talk again. Watching you and knowing that I come from you is what has given me the strength to face every obstacle thrown my way. There were times I'm sure you worried about what was going on with me and didn't know how to ask me about it. Times you probably wanted, to, wanted me to be comfortable enough to just say it. I regret not telling you a lot earlier that I was having feelings towards boys because you definitely made the space available for it. There was no time when I didn't feel safe in your presence or that I couldn't talk to you. It was all me. Know that you did everything you could to provide the best environment a kid like me could need. I can only remember one point of real contention I've ever had with you. You were adamant I wouldn't go into the hair care business. <laughs> Even though I was really good at it. As an adult, I can totally understand that many of the choices you made were for me were out of my safety, not the denial of my personality. The world was an unsafe place for a kid like me. And honestly, had I wanted to go into hair as an adult, I don't think you ever would have blinked. Especially knowing that your brother, uncle, worked side by side with you as a I remember the times you let your bills go late because I was behind on mine. So you would scrape together what you had to ensure that I didn't go without, especially while in college. And when I came to you on that day on the phone in tears at the age of 25, you didn't miss a beat. You told me that being gay would never be seen as a disappointment to the family. That your only concern was that I stayed safe and made good decisions. I wish I would have listened to that last part more, but I wouldn't change my path for the world. My scariest memory is getting that call back in 2015 from my Sarah, telling me that you had had a brain aneurysm and that I needed to get to Jersey immediately. I cried all three hours of the drive from Maryland. I remember getting there and finding you still in good spirits. You were about to have another brain surgery, but your concern was that Garrett and I weren't worrying. Once again, you came out of surgery, and by the next day, you were fighting back to get to yourself. That day would also be the first day I ever had to feed you. In that moment, it was bittersweet, but now looking back, it was just beautiful. To be able to take care of the woman who has done so much for me throughout my life, the woman who nursed me as a child and nurtured me as an adult, the woman who I continue to work so very hard for so that you'll always be proud of me and hopefully not have to work anymore. <laughs> Thank you for always being there for me then and now. Thank you for never making me feel like anything was wrong with me and always reassuring me that I was perfectly made for this journey. I love you. That is, that's Kay, uh, George's mother. I'm calling you George because that's your professional name. That's cool. <laughs> uh, so, uh, one of the things we did talk about um, was you said that you did want to take a couple of questions. Um, so uh, if anyone has any question uh, that they, they want uh, you know, to, to speak, um, I'm gonna just repeat your question after you just to make sure uh, that, that uh, it can be heard by everyone. So we have just a few moments for questions. I think all the questions have been answered. <laughs> oh, there's uh, Julie, go ahead. Um, I have a question. I really loved how you wrote about trauma, and I also loved the details of your sexual experiences. What led you to make the decision to be brutally honest? <laughs> so the question is, what led uh, you to be brutally honest? And yeah. Julie, you're right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay, okay. Um, 
So, so it's funny, right? Because I wrote when I wrote the first draft, and I even wrote about like my sexual experiences. Like it was kind of sanitized, and my editor Grace, who is going to be the editor for my next five books, because I have five more coming. <laughs> Grace in the notes on the side was like, this is not spicy enough. And I was like, okay. And so I called her, I was like, well, this is for young adults. Like, can I write like that? She like, please, like, you, she like, these are young adults. You got to explain everything. They want to know what the room smelled like, what color was the sheets, what was on the TV. They want to know every single thing that was going on in that moment. And so I was like, all right, well, I'll just say, say it. I'll just write it exactly how I remembered it and how it was. I think for me though, it became, because like writing about your experiences like that, sometimes you can feel like a little cringe yourself or feel a little embarrassed yourself. But for me, it was like the thing that out, like I had to balance what outweighed what. And so it was like, if I leave this experience out the book and this is the thing that could have helped a young adult yeah. or could have protected a young adult, mm -hmm. then I would be more hurt or more embarrassed by that than just saying it and putting it in the book. And so, I, I put those parts in the book, even though they were hard, but I've had kids go up at school board meetings and name their abusers because they read the book. I've seen kids, I've literally seen kids hear by it, talk by it, and do that type of work. And so that's why I am so brutally honest is because I know for a fact that in putting my, my story out there in that way, it helps heal others, but it also empowers them to put their story out there in the same way. Uh, okay. Uh, yes. Yeah. Hi, I'm Sindel. I'm a bookseller. I'm just letting you know, headquartered in Plainfield. We sold a lot of your copies. <laughs> and I'm also a professor, and we share a mutual friend, which I'll tell you about later. Okay. Um, <laughs> I do have a question. Um, I want to know, because it's really cool to say that you are a band author, right? Like, oh yeah, we're cool. We, we there, there's a process and resistance yeah. that we all know too well. And I wanted to know your actual inner thoughts with the idea of being a band author, because although it's cool to say that in the socials yeah. and in public, <laughs> it, it can hurt. Yes. And I, I would love to know, I'm not like trauma searching or anything, no. I would love to know how those inner thoughts were, how you were able to overcome them, if you're still dealing yeah. with them. All those things are important, so I would love to know that. Yeah. Every, everybody heard that, right? The question yes. was about <laughs> band books. Okay. Yeah, it's not easy. It's a very bittersweet thing. It's like on one end, it is cool to be on a list with Toni Morrison. Right. <laughs> so I'm gonna wear that like a badge of honor because I don't know if I'll ever make another one with her. Like, it's dope to be on a list with Toni Morrison, right? The second thing is like, if your book is banned, it's probably the, the book that, that everybody needs to read, right? It's like, it must be something real valuable in that book if they don't want people to know about it, right? Um, but I think the flip side of that is it's very hard every day sometimes to like really go through this because it's like I'm the first person to go through this mm -hmm. and so and it was like I didn't realize it until a friend told me like well you know you're the first person to go through this right and I was like what are you talking about mm -hmm. and they were like nobody's ever been banned like this before like mm -hmm. you can look at the history of book banning in this country like even when Toni Morrison's book was pulled it may have been pulled in a state right. like but it was like or maybe pulled in a county or yeah. it may have been challenged here yeah um they were like nobody has ever gone through what you've gone through as a black author and I had to really sit with that like damn, like, you know, when you're doing blueprint work, like when you're the blueprint, there really is no roadmap. There is no guide. And so there are times, there are just days I wake up and I don't know what I'm doing, but I know I'm doing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So like, and I think that's part of like, maybe why my su I'm successful is because there are days I'm like, I have no idea what I'm doing, but I am doing and I keep doing. Um, and I almost liken it to like how Cicely Tyson, right before she passed, they were like, what do you want to be remembered for? And she was like, I just want everybody to remember I did my best. Mm -hmm. Like that's just so simple, but so powerful, right? Because it's like, that means that there were some days that I didn't show up. There were some days I couldn't be this person, but I did my best. Mm -hmm. And so I think about like how I wake up every day is like, I just do my best. Um, some days that means I'm very emotional about the book fans and I have to cry about it and I go sit at my altar with Nanny and them and I talk to them out loud about it. Um, but some days I'm like, you know, putting on my Kevlar, grabbing my, my sword and my shield and going out to fight, like, you know? So it's like living at that duality at times, um, but it's not easy. It's a lot of pressure. 
Um, and you know, again, like the fact that I have to have like police officers at book events, like yeah. it's like just scary times, you know, that we live in. And so I'm always thinking about that, you know. Um, you know, I grew up with a father where you never sit with your back to the entrance, so I'm always, <laughs> you know, so you always sit to the corner so you can see the room. You always know where all the exits are in the room. Like when I think about stuff like that, like that's my yeah. life, and it's okay. Like you know, some days it's like, damn, this is crazy. This is my life, but it's also like. It's okay, right? Like, because I get to see what my work does in the world. And in the book being banned, it gave the book the visibility to reach the people that never knew it existed. Yeah. And so that's the part that I, I guess I take solace in is the fact that, like, there were kids who had no idea that they had a text for them until you tried to ban it, right? So now you have just activated a whole generation of people that y'all never knew could be activated in this way. And it's my text that's the, the guiding thing for them. Right. Love that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So mine is not really a question. It's more of a statement. Yes. Um, I just finished my 25th year as a public teacher, public school teacher in Newark, New Jersey, yes. in yes. the South Ward. Um, <laughs> and I'm a mother of a grandson. So I read the book for my son, and then halfway through, I was like, this is not about my son. This is about the kids that I know from 25 years ago who identify as queer but can't. They can't stand up in school in the South Ward of Newark, and it just, it was so powerful to read your words and to put myself in the shoes of the two boys that I had in seventh and eighth grade, mm -hmm. and the boy that I had in first grade 20 years ago, and they're the ones that need a copy of your book. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, I think we have time for one, one more question. Hi, I'm Jelani. Um, I remember seeing your video on Vice with the other oh, reference. So, because it was like, it was like kind of scary, but also hilarious. It was just a really cool show. Do you regret doing it or would you do it again? <laughs> so the video that he's talking about on Vice is the, it's got millions of views. I, a ten million. Yeah. <laughs> so I got hit, okay. I got hit with a bait and switch. My good friend is a producer, still a producer, I just filmed with him again, but he was just like, oh yeah, you know, we'll just be up here talking about like, you know, politics and stuff. I'm like, all right, cool. So we get to set and I see these people, I'm like, okay, so they sit us up and so they do the introduction and they're like, and this is the black liberals versus the black conservatives. <laughs> I'm sitting to myself like, black conservatives? And the girl sitting in front of me, she like, I voted for Donald Trump. I'm free, I make money, and I'm like, what the hell did I just walk into? <laughs> like, and so now it's like they're fighting, like, so this video goes, has gone viral multiple times on TikTok, especially my talking points, because I just got tired and just started reading everybody. And so everybody was like, George, you just read everyone in the room. It was like, you dumb because it is, you dumb because it is, like, this ain't the truth. I'm fact checking people like them in real time, but the video went viral. Um, I don't regret doing it. A lot of people still talk to me to this day are like, you did the Vice video, and you was eating everybody up. And I was like, yeah. And then that's so crazy that you became like this author, like all these other things, because they was like, you just was like a journalist that just was sitting there tired of everybody's BS that day. <laughs> Mind you, the video, because they did a short video, so it was only a seven minute video initially. It got so many views that they extended it to 40 minutes. But realistically, we filmed for four hours. So I had to sit with these, Conservatives. <laughs> I had to sit with them for four hours battling them. And so, like, when we left, the liberals, we all went to the bar together. And we just sat, like, what did we just go through? Like, and so it is kind of wild now, all these years later, when we look at how politics are, because that really was like the, the boiling point, like when yeah. we were really starting to talk about like the issues of the country and like how we got here today. So, but yes, I would do it again. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, okay. So, uh, you know, uh, just to sort of, uh, I think we can take one more comment question. This is, hi, hi. thank you for doing this. Really. <laughs> I had a question more about the aesthetics because it really attracted me to your, your floral crown. And um, mm. because of your relationship with your nanny, mm. and my we have a relationship with our family, we call her nanny too, <laughs> and we're very close. I wanted to know if the flowers, because they meant a lot to me for my grandmother, mm. do they reflect anything to do with your family your grandmother? Because it's so beautiful, <laughs> it's just stunning. Uh, so, yes. <laughs> <I'm not even laughs> sure. like, the short answer is yes. Um, mm -hmm. So 
that that's a different situation. Even though the bird of paradise is in there because that's my mom's favorite flower. Um, so that's always like in it. But on the book cover, so I designed the book cover, um, which is rare. Like most authors, they don't allow you. They kind of send you mock-ups and be like, what you think? But like I went in there and I was like, all right, so for the cover, I want <laughs> da-da-da-da, da-da-da-da. And my editor team was like, um, authors don't tell us what the cover is going to look like. I was like, okay, well, I'm going to tell you what this cover needs to look like because y'all not just going to put words on the front. Right. And, and try and put it out to the world. I was like, I want people to know that this book is queer from the cover, right? I want them to judge a book by its cover. So <laughs> I was like, this is what I want this book cover to look like. Um, so the flower crown, so the yellow roses, um, I'm an alpha, I'm a member of Alpha Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. And so the yellow roses are actually our fraternity flower. Right. And so a lot of people, you know, you think about masculinity in this mm -hmm. way, even though all the fraternities have a flower. Mm -hmm. And so I thought that was like a really cool juxtaposition to have like the fraternity flower as like part of the flower crown. Um, you can see the bird of paradise is in the front. That's my mom's favorite flower. And clearly after the chapter I read, you see why she needed to be involved in the cover. And then the middle flower is the point, is it poinsettia or poinsettia? Poinsettia. 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 All right, the poinsettia, because that was like, I, that just makes me think of Nanny. Like, she used to take those flowers from the church um, during Christmas and bring every single one of them home. And she would have it down, and she bought them. But you make sure that the church were at the church, right? At the church and brought them home. And that was like her thing was like, that, that flower just always reminds me of her. She was such a person who loved Christmas. She used to make us sing them terrible Christmas carols. Yeah. <laughs> um, but like, and so that was like something that reminded me of her. She also was a gardener. She taught me and G how to garden at a very young age. Like it was like just her thing. She just was really good with the earth, with flowers, with plants um, and all of that. And so, yes, yeah, so it was important that like the flower crown kind of represented the three aspects of me um, in my life. Thank you. So uh, we're going to sort of wrap this part up because I know that uh, I see a whole bunch of books. A number of them probably need to be signed. <laughs> um, <laughs> excuse me. We also have our mayor, the Honorable Adrian O. Mapp, is here with First Lady Amelia Mapp. Uh, I believe they're going to do a proclamation. I also have a resolution from my colleagues and myself. Oh on the county. Uh, so I, I guess we should probably do the mayoral proclamation first. I probably don't need to read my okay. resolution. I'll just say, we said very nice things. <laughs> so uh, I guess, yeah, so you, you're gonna sit through the mayor saying very nice things about you. I think you need the mayor. All right. Please help me welcome the City of Plainfield Mayor's Adrian O'Map, who will present the City Proclamation. Well, George, first let me thank you for being here. I am sorry that I missed most of your presentation, but for the portion that I was here for, I thoroughly enjoyed it and I appreciate you. Thank you. Right. And this is a proclamation from the city from my office and it's honoring author and activist George M. Johnson. June is Pride Month and the city of Plainfield is proud and honored to recognize Plainfield native George M. Johnson, a New York Times best-selling non-binary author, journalist, executive producer, and activist. George is the author of two young adult, two young adult memoirs, All Boys Aren't Blue and We Are Not Broken, discussing their childhood and adolescence as a black queer boy in Plainfield, New Jersey. All Boys Aren't Blue is one of the most banned books in the United States, and George is a national advocate for literary freedom. So whereas George started his remarkable career as a journalist writing about race, gender, sex, intersectional culture, health, HIV, and politics. And whereas in 2020, George captured the nation's attention with his debut of 
All Boys Aren't Blue, a memoir manifesto. In this series of personal coming of age essays aimed at the young adult audience, George explored such topics as gender identity, toxic masculinity, brotherhood, consent, and black joy. George said, the work I do as a black queer storyteller ensures that black stories, which have always existed but rarely get told, finally get the attention and respect they deserve from our lens. And whereas the New York Times bestseller All Boys Aren't Blue was selected as one of 2020's best books by Kirkus, Amazon, and Goodread, the New York Public Library and the Chicago Library, among others, and whereas in 2021, George's second memoir, We Are Not Broken, celebrated black boy, celebrated black boyhood and explored growing up with brothers, cousins, and their fiercely devoted grandmother in Plainfield. <laughs> the book was the second honoree for the Carter G. Woodson Black Award recognizing books that accurately and sensitively depict the experience of one or more historically marginalized racial slash ethnic groups in the United States. We Are Not Broken also received the nonfiction honor book in the young adult category from the International Literacy Association and whereas for their commitment to telling stories from diverse perspectives, George was listed on the Route 100 list of influential African-Americans in 2020, the Out 100 list of influential LGBTQ people in 2021, and Time 100 next 2022 as an advocate for their extraordinary efforts to shape our world and define our future. And whereas in 2021 and 2022, the American Literary Association's Office of Intellectual Freedom named All Boys Aren't Blue the third and second most challenged and banned book in the United States. In addition, school boards in at least 10 states have removed All Boys Aren't Blue from their libraries. And whereas in 2022, the Banned Books Coalition, an international alliance of diverse organizations committed to increasing awareness of the annual celebration of the freedom to read, made George the honorary chair of Banned Books Week. And whereas, in 2023, George M. Johnson's memoir, All Boys Aren't Blue, adapted for film, is nominated for Outstanding Daytime Special by the National Academy of Television, Arts and Sciences, as part of the 50th Annual Daytime Emmy Awards. Therefore, it is resolved, I, Adrian O'Mac, Mayor of the City of Plainfield, by virtue of the authority vested in me by the Constitution and laws of the United States, to hereby celebrate the literary advocacy contributions of George M. Johnson, creating young adult works to empower others to live purposeful, authentic lives, and to recognize their activism and commitment to the freedom to read, which is essential for a strong democracy, I hereby proclaim June, 20, June 24, 2023, <laughs> as George M. Johnson Day in the <laughs>
Oh, you're going to do your proclamation. That's well, fine. I will. I okay. Think. <laughs> okay. You're going to do your proclamation. Okay. You're going to do your proclamation. I will tell you. Ours is not as detailed <laughs> as the mayor's. Um, but I really appreciate the mayor uh, and his staff for really highlighting all of yeah, the yeah, contributions yeah, yeah. George has made yeah. thus far. Uh, so, whereas, <laughs> where would we be without that ad? <laughs> the board wishes to recognize Plainfield board and writer, activist, and educator George M. Johnson, author of All Boys Aren't Blue, their best-selling memoir manifesto during 2023 LGBTQ plus Pride Month, and whereas the board commends George for returning to their hometown of Plainfield to share their brilliant memoir with their community at the Plainfield Public Library. Yes, yes, yes. And whereas George has been lauded for their frankness and authenticity in telling their story of growing up black and queer in the city of Plainfield and beyond. And whereas George maintains a commitment to helping black and queer youth especially safely navigate to adulthood by speaking out on their behalf. And whereas George's memoir holds the proud distinction of being on numerous banned books lists due to its author's fearlessness and unflinching honesty. And whereas George's accomplishments as a writer include publications in Essence, The Advocate, Teen Vogue, and dozens of other pop, uh, publications, and whereas George continues to bring honor and distinction to the County of Union and to the City of Plainfield, now therefore be it resolved that the Board of Commissioners hereby commends George M. Johnson of Plainfield on their great achievement in the literary world and continued LGBTQ plus activism, and be it further resolved that a copy of this resolution, suitably prepared, be presented to George M. Johnson as a sincere token of this board's congratulations and best wishes, signed and sealed today. <laughs> so much and I just have to add when you told when you told the story about boys and girls and the way they get things to play with my husband was a bit of a comedian and he used to, he used to go around and say I don't understand why girls get dolls and boys get cowboys and Indians what what kind of usefulness is that for them growing <laughs> so yes he agreed with you <laughs> All right, so throughout your works, George, you mentioned your love for books and how you would spend your days at the library. Your love for books didn't just lead you to become an ex exceptional human being, but an equally exceptional author. As you already know, libraries exist to defend the freedom to read, and today the Plainfield Public Library is honored to issue you an honorary lifetime library card. <laughs> as you refer to yourself in one of your books, only deserves a lifetime membership <laughs> to their first public library. Yes. Yes. Cynthia Slade, our board trustee and secretary, will now present an honorary library card from the Plainfield Public Library. <laughs> first of all, 
if nobody has told you yet, I am so proud of you. Yeah. Activist, journalist, author, Emmy nominee, you are, you are it. <laughs> <laughs> This card is, I guess it's sort of like the library's key to the city. <laughs> That's what it is. It's small, it doesn't have an expiration date, it's a lifetime membership, okay? And it's for you, and we just want you to know that you belong to us, and you are always welcome here. <laughs> Bishop Barr has produced a lot of HBCU graduates. They had me right up. Before we proceed to the book signing, we would like to take a moment to acknowledge George's family, many of whom are present today. And we are sure that George's grandmother, Nanny, is also present in spirit. We would like for them to please stand up and face the audience. And an, ex an inspiration and an example of the support and love that all children or adolescents should experience growing up. Thank you for who you are and for being here today. We also want to thank and acknowledge the following people and institutions for their assistance in making this event a success. City of Plainfield Honorable Mayor Adrian Mapp, Plainfield Performing Arts Center Director Sharon McGuire, Plainfield Police Department's Director James Abney, the Libraries of Union County Consortium, Union County Commissioner Rebecca Williams, and last but definitely not least, our wonderful library staff who are the front lines defending freedom to read everywhere. And you, George, thank you for allowing us to meet you in person and celebrate your achievements. We're proud to acknowledge you as a Plainfielder and a member of our library community and wish you much continued success. We're now going to proceed to the book signing and we will be doing that in an orderly fashion. <laughs> <laughs> you will see staff members, wave staff members, <laughs> calling people by rows. Please do not stand up until your row is called. Thank you all so much for celebrating Pride Month and George M. Johnson today. Thank you.